my parents kicked me out for changing my major. So I bought their house and tripled their rent. I was 22, trying to get my degree and working part-time at this crappy little grocery store that paid me peanuts. My parents, Tom and Linda, were always breathing down my neck, acting like my life belonged to them. They had this perfect picture in their heads of how my life should turn out, and they weren't shy about pushing me towards it every single day. They thought they knew better, but man, did they have no clue what I actually wanted. So one night, we're sitting at the dinner table, just a regular Thursday night or something, and I'm trying to quietly eat this overcooked meatloaf my mom made. It was like chewing cardboard, but I wasn't about to say anything because they'd find a way to turn that into a lecture on how ungrateful I am. Anyway, out of nowhere, my dad, with his usual fake, concerned dad voice, goes, how's that business degree going? Now, I knew this conversation was going to come up eventually, but I wasn't ready for it. My heart started racing, and I could feel my stomach drop, but I had to rip off the band-aid. I put my fork down, staring at the pile of peas I'd been pushing around my plate like a five-year-old. Uh, about that, I started, my voice a little shaky, I've been thinking about switching majors. The room went silent, like you could hear the clock ticking in the hallway, and that's when I knew I was in for it. Switching majors. My dad practically spits his food out, his face turned this weird shade of red that only ever happens when he's seriously pissed off. Yeah, I want to switch to computer science, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I felt like I was standing in front of a firing squad, though. Before I could even finish, my mom jumped in with her usual condescending tone. Jake, thinking's been your strong suit, she said with this tight smile, like she was making a joke, but we all knew she wasn't. That's how she gets her digs in, always wrapped in a fake laugh or a so-called joke. I just sat there, swallowing the anger that was bubbling up inside me. I wanted to yell at them, tell them they were wrong, but I knew better. That'd just lead to more yelling, and I wasn't in the mood for a full-blown argument. But my dad wasn't done yet. He slammed his fork down on the table so hard it made the plates rattle. Computer science. Are you out of your damn mind? Business is what's going to make you money. You're throwing away your future on some stupid hobby. I tried to explain. It's not a hobby, dad. I'm really into it, and I think I could be good at it. You think? He cut me off again. Passion doesn't pay the bills, Jake. You're being reckless. You need to think about your future, not just whatever you feel like doing right now. My mom nodded along, of course, adding fuel to the fire. You're not a child anymore. You don't just get to play around with your future. That's when it hit me. They didn't care about what I wanted, not one bit. To them, I was just this project they were working on, and any deviation from their grand plan meant I was screwing everything up. They didn't even stop to consider that maybe, just maybe, I knew what was best for me. After dinner, I went up to my room, slammed the door shut, and collapsed on my bed. I felt like a weight was pressing down on my chest. I pulled out my phone and called Ashley. She was the only person who got it, who understood what I was going through. How'd it go, she asked, knowing damn well how it went. Like a freaking disaster, I muttered, rubbing my eyes. They totally freaked out when I told them. It was like I'd just told them I was dropping out to join a circus or something. She sighed on the other end of the line. Jake, you've got to stand up for yourself. This is your life, not theirs. You don't owe them anything. I know, I know, but they're my parents, you know. It's not that easy. I get it, she said softly. But you're 22, Jake. You're not a kid anymore. You've got to start living your own life or they're going to keep running it for you. I sat there, staring at the ceiling, thinking about what she said. She was right. I was an adult now, and it was about time I started acting like one. The next day, I woke up feeling a mix of dread and determination. I had to tell them, for real this time. I couldn't just keep letting them decide my life for me. So I walked downstairs, my heart pounding in my chest, and found them sitting in the living room, watching TV. Mom, Dad, we need to talk, I said, my voice shaky but firm enough. My dad muted the TV, and they both looked at me like they were expecting some big announcement. And in a way, I guess it was. I've made my decision. I'm switching to computer science. My dad's eyes narrowed. No, you're not. I stood my ground this time. Yes, I am. I'm an adult, and this is my choice. For a second, I thought maybe, just maybe, they'd back off and let me have this one. But then mom stood up, crossing her arms over her chest. If you're such an adult, then you can support yourself, she said, her voice cold. You've got 24 hours to pack your things and get out. 
I just stood there, frozen, like my brain couldn't quite process what she was saying. What? I finally managed to say. You can't be serious. Oh, we're serious, my dad growled. You want to make your own decisions. Fine. But you're doing it on your own. I don't even remember walking back to my room. I just remember the overwhelming feeling of betrayal, like they've been waiting for an excuse to kick me out all along. I was their kid, their son, and they were just tossing me out like I meant nothing. I called Mike, my best friend, the second I got back to my room. I didn't even bother to keep my voice steady anymore. Dude, they kicked me out, I said, my hands shaking. I don't know what to do. Without missing a beat, Mike replied, pack your stuff, man, you're staying with me. As I threw my clothes into a duffel bag, it finally hit me. I was homeless. My own parents had thrown me out like I was garbage. But at the same time, as messed up as it sounds, a part of me felt relieved. For the first time in my life, I wasn't going to be under their control anymore. I was free, but I had no idea what that really meant yet. The next few days after getting kicked out were a complete blur. I was crashing at Mike's apartment, trying to get my head straight, but it felt like everything in my life had just been flipped upside down. I mean, one minute I'm arguing with my parents over my major, and the next, I'm homeless. It didn't even feel real, like it was happening to someone else, not me. Mike's place was fine. He lived in this tiny one-bedroom apartment that smelled like old pizza and gym socks, but I couldn't really complain. I had a roof over my head and a friend who wasn't about to ask me to leave. But man, it was cramped. I was sleeping on his ratty old couch that squeaked every time I moved. I didn't have a choice, though. I wasn't about to go crawling back to my parents and beg them to take me in. That wasn't happening. I tried to focus on my classes, but it was almost impossible. Every time I sat down to do my assignments, my brain would just drift off, thinking about what happened. It was like my mind wouldn't let me forget for even a second that I didn't have a real home anymore. And then, of course, there was the money problem. My savings were already draining fast, and I didn't have enough to make it long if I wasn't working more hours. But with classes and trying to figure out where my life was going, it wasn't like I could just pick up a second job. Ashley kept trying to be supportive, but even she couldn't fix the mess I was in. I remember one day she called me up, telling me we should go get lunch, try to take my mind off things for a bit. We ended up at this cheap sandwich shop down the street from Mike's place. I hadn't been eating much since I left home, so I figured it might help to get out for a bit. So, how are you holding up? She asked, biting into her sandwich. I shrugged. Honestly, not great. I can't focus on school, and my money's running out fast. I don't know how long I can keep this up. She gave me that sympathetic look, the one I've been getting from pretty much everyone since I told them what happened. You're doing the best you can, Jake. This isn't the end of the world, okay? It's just a bump in the road. I laughed, but it wasn't a happy laugh. Yeah, a bump the size of a mountain. She reached across the table and grabbed my hand. You'll figure this out. I know you will. You've always been smart, even if your parents don't see it. Her words were nice, but they didn't change the fact that I was stuck in a situation I didn't know how to get out of. It felt like no matter what I did, I was just treading water, trying not to drown. After lunch, I headed back to Mike's and tried to focus on my assignments, but the more I stared at the computer screen, the more I realized I was falling behind. My grades were slipping, and the thought of dropping out was creeping into my mind more and more. I didn't want to do it, but it felt like I was running out of options. I couldn't juggle everything. I was barely keeping my head above water as it was. A few weeks passed, and things didn't get any better. My savings hit rock bottom, and I knew it was only a matter of time before I had to make a decision. Mike could only cover for me so much, and I wasn't going to keep freeloading off him forever. The day I dropped out of college was one of the worst days of my life. It felt like I was admitting defeat, like I was giving up on everything I'd worked for. I remember sitting in the dean's office, signing the paperwork, and feeling like a complete failure. I'd always thought I'd be the first person in my family to finish college, but now that dream was slipping away, just like everything else. As soon as I walked out of that office, it hit me hard. I was on my own, with no degree, no solid plan, and barely any money. That night, I sat on Mike's couch, staring at my phone, wondering what I was going to do. Ashley called, as she always did, checking in on me. So, what's the plan now? She asked softly. I don't know, I admit it. I'm looking for more work, but nothing's coming through. It's like every door is closing in my face. There was a pause on the other end, 
and I could tell she was trying to come up with something to say, something that would make me feel better. You're not giving up, right? I don't have a choice, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I dropped out today. Oh, Jake, she whispered. I'm sorry, but this isn't the end. You'll find something, I know you will. I wanted to believe her, but it was getting harder to stay hopeful. I spent the next few days pounding the pavement, applying to every job I could find, but nothing stuck. The only place that offered me anything was Sunnyside Diner, a greasy spoon that felt like it hadn't been cleaned since the 80s. It wasn't exactly my dream job, but it was better than nothing. They needed someone to flip burgers and mop floors, and I needed money, so I took it. The hours were brutal, and the pay was terrible, but at least I had something. I spent my days covered in grease, slapping burgers onto the grill while my manager Earl barked orders at me like I was in boot camp. He was a gruff, no-nonsense guy who didn't seem to care about anything but the bottom line, but at least he noticed when I worked hard. After about a month at the diner, Earl pulled me aside during a slow shift. Kid, you've got a decent work ethic. You interested in picking up some extra hours? I wiped the sweat off my forehead, trying to look interested. Yeah, sure, what's up? I got a buddy who needs a night guard at this office building downtown. Pays better than here. You in? I didn't even have to think about it. Yeah, I'm in. Just like that, I was working two jobs, flipping burgers by day and guarding an empty building by night. It wasn't glamorous, but at least it was something. Sleep became a luxury I couldn't afford, and most nights I was running on fumes, barely able to keep my eyes open, but I had no other choice. I had to survive. Ashley kept sending me links to tech internships, trying to help me get back on track, but I just didn't have the time or energy to apply. My life was all about survival now. It wasn't about chasing dreams or passions anymore. It was about keeping my head above water, day by day. Every night, as I sat in that dark, empty office building, staring at the flickering lights of the city outside, I couldn't help but wonder how the hell my life had turned out like this. Just a few months ago, I had plans, dreams, and a future. Now, I was just trying to get by, one shift at a time. And the worst part was, I didn't see a way out. Working two jobs was hell. Straight up, no other way to describe it. The diner was greasy and chaotic, and the night shifts at that empty office building were just mind-numbing. I was running on like four hours of sleep, drinking energy drinks like they were water, and basically living out of a beat-up backpack that I took everywhere. But at least I had some money coming in. It wasn't much, but it was enough to keep me going. Mike didn't say it, but I think he was relieved that I could start pitching in for rent. I didn't want to be that guy, freeloading off my best friend while my life fell apart, so I made sure to hand him whatever I could. I was still crashing on his couch, but at least now I wasn't a total burden. Then, out of nowhere, things started to shift. I don't know if it was dumb luck or the universe finally giving me a break, but one day while I was flipping burgers at the diner, this guy came in for lunch. I didn't think anything of it at first, just another random customer. He looked kind of tired, like the rest of us who worked too many hours for not enough pay. After his meal, he came up to the counter to pay, and as I handed him his change, he glanced at the computer screen I had opened behind the register. I'd been working on some coding exercises during my break, just trying to stay sharp, you know. The guy raised an eyebrow. You into coding? He asked, his voice kind of casual but curious. I nodded, trying not to seem too eager. Yeah, I've been teaching myself, hoping to make a career out of it eventually. He chuckled. Well, I might have something for you. My company's looking for entry-level IT guys, nothing fancy, but it's a start. I blinked, not really believing what I was hearing. Wait, seriously? Yeah, he shrugged, like it wasn't a big deal. Send me your resume, I'll put in a word for you. He handed me his business card, and I swear my hands were shaking as I took it. It was like this tiny shred of hope that I hadn't felt in months. That night, I didn't even care how tired I was from the double shifts. I went back to Mike's place, fired up my laptop, and worked on my resume. It wasn't perfect, but it was something. I shot the guy an email before I could overthink it, then tried not to get my hopes up. A few days passed, and I didn't hear anything back. Part of me figured the guy was just being nice, and I'd never actually get a call. But then, one afternoon, as I was sitting in that boring, empty office building during my night shift, my phone buzzed. It was an email, from that company. I stared at the screen for a solid minute, too scared to open it. But when I finally did, it wasn't a rejection. It was an invitation to interview. I couldn't believe it. I'd gone from flipping burgers and guarding empty buildings to, maybe, just maybe, getting an actual job in IT. 
the interview wasn't anything fancy. I borrowed one of Mike's decent shirts and took the bus to the office. It was a small startup, nothing flashy, but it felt like a whole new world compared to where I'd been. The guy from the diner, whose name I now knew was Trevor, greeted me at the door and introduced me to his boss, Tina. Tina was tough, but fair. She asked me about my experience, and I was upfront about the fact that I didn't have a degree, but I'd been teaching myself everything I could about coding and IT. I showed her some of the small projects I'd been working on, and she didn't seem too impressed at first. But then, she asked me to solve a problem right there on the spot, something technical I hadn't done before. I panicked for a second, my mind racing. But then, I remembered all those late nights I'd spent teaching myself, working through coding challenges just for the hell of it. I took a deep breath and got to work, trying not to let the pressure get to me. When I was done, Tina glanced over my shoulder at the screen. She didn't say much, just nodded and looked at Trevor. He's got potential, she said. Let's give him a shot. I didn't even know how to react. I wanted to jump up and scream, but I just sat there trying to play it cool, even though I felt like my heart was about to explode out of my chest. I started the next week as an entry-level IT guy. It wasn't glamorous, but I didn't care. For the first time in months, I wasn't flipping burgers or guarding some creepy office building at 3 a.m. I was actually doing something I loved. Tina and Trevor were patient with me, showing me the ropes, but they also pushed me to keep learning. They didn't hold my hand through everything, and that's what I needed. Nights were still rough, though. I was still juggling both jobs for a while, just to make sure I didn't screw up this opportunity. So I'd work at the startup during the day, then head straight to the diner or the office building after. Sleep was still a rare luxury, and most mornings I'd wake up feeling like I'd been hit by a truck. Ashley stuck with me through it all. She was my rock, always sending me job links or checking in on how things were going at the startup. I don't think I'd have made it without her. Every time I felt like I was about to fall apart, she'd remind me that I was doing this for a reason, that I was building something for myself. After a few months of grinding, I finally reached a breaking point. I couldn't keep working two jobs and expect to stay sane, so I went to Earl, the diner manager, and told him I had to quit. He wasn't thrilled, but he understood. Good luck, kid, he said, giving me one of those rare moments of sincerity. You're a hard worker. You'll be fine. Walking out of that diner for the last time felt like a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I still had the security job for the nights I wasn't at the startup, but at least I wasn't burning myself out as fast. As time went on, I threw myself into the IT gig with everything I had. I spent every spare minute learning new skills, taking on projects, and soaking up as much knowledge as I could. I wasn't just trying to survive anymore. I was trying to build something. Something real. Something that was mine. It wasn't easy, and there were days when I doubted myself, when I wondered if I was just chasing some pipe dream, but every time I got through a challenge or solved a problem that had stumped me for hours, I felt that spark again. That fire that had been missing for so long, and slowly, bit by bit, I started to see a future for myself again. Not the future my parents had planned for me, but one that I actually wanted, and for the first time in a long time, that felt like enough. A few months into the new job, things started to feel different. Not in a bad way, just a way I hadn't felt in a long time. I was finally doing something I actually enjoyed, and I wasn't dragging myself out of bed just to survive another day at some dead-end job. The whole IT thing, coding, troubleshooting, yeah it wasn't glamorous, but I liked it, and it was mine. Something I had worked my butt off to get. I remember sitting at my desk one afternoon, buried in some code, when my boss, Tina, walked over. She wasn't the type to beat around the bush, which I respected. She leaned on the edge of my desk and said, Jake, I've been watching your work these past few months. You've got potential, but you're holding back. I blinked at her, completely caught off guard. Holding back. What do you mean? She crossed her arms, giving me that look like she already knew the answer, but wanted me to say it out loud. You've got the skills, but you're playing it safe. I see you sticking to what you know. You're not taking risks, not pushing yourself. You're comfortable, and that's fine, but comfort doesn't get you anywhere in this business. I didn't know what to say at first. She wasn't wrong. I'd been doing the work, sure, but I wasn't exactly going above and beyond. I guess, after everything that had happened, I was just happy to be in a stable place for once, and I didn't want to screw it up. Look, Tina continued, you're good, Jake, but if you really want to stand out, you need to step it up. Take on projects that scare you a little. That's how you grow. I nodded, still processing what she'd said. It wasn't like I hadn't heard something similar before, but this time it hit different. 
This wasn't some lecture from my parents about how I was wasting my potential. This was someone who saw what I was capable of and was pushing me to be better. So, I took her advice. I started volunteering for more complex projects, stuff I wasn't entirely sure I could handle. There were definitely moments where I felt like I was in way over my head, but every time I figured something out, that feeling of accomplishment made it all worth it. One day, Tina assigned me this big project for a new client. It was way more responsibility than I'd ever had before, and part of me was freaking out, but another part of me was excited. This was the kind of challenge I needed to prove to myself that I could handle bigger things. I spent weeks working on it. Late nights, weekends, pretty much any free time I had was dedicated to making sure it went perfectly. When I finally submitted the finished project, I felt like I'd just run away. Like I'd pushed myself to the limit and come out the other side stronger. A few days later, Tina pulled me into her office. I sat down, trying to keep cool, but I was nervous. What if I'd messed something up? She didn't waste any time. Jake, the client loved your work. They're moving forward with everything you suggested. I let out a breath I didn't even realize I'd been holding. Really? She nodded, a small smile on her face. You did good. Keep this up, and you're going to go far here. I walked out of her office feeling ten feet tall. For the first time in what felt like forever, I wasn't just surviving. I was thriving. I started to see a future that wasn't just about scraping by, but actually building something real. The more I threw myself into my work, the more I realized how much I'd been holding back, not just in my job, but in life. It was like this fog had lifted, and I could finally see what I was capable of if I stopped letting fear hold me back. It wasn't easy, and I made plenty of mistakes along the way, but each one taught me something, pushed me forward. Around that time, things with Ashley started to shift too. She'd always been supportive, but now she seemed proud of me in a way she hadn't before. We'd go out to dinner, and instead of me venting about my crappy jobs or money problems, I'd be talking about this new project I was working on or some cool thing I'd learned, and she'd listen, really listen, like she could see I was finally on the path I was meant to be on. One night, we were sitting on her couch after I'd just finished a particularly brutal week of work. I was exhausted, but in a good way, and she looked over at me with this smile on her face. You know, she said softly, I always knew you'd get here. Maybe not in the way you planned, but you're doing it. You're making it happen. I didn't know how to respond to that. I mean, she'd been with me through the worst of it, through the days when I didn't even know if I'd make rent or where my next paycheck was coming from, but she stuck around, never once making me feel like I wasn't enough. Hearing her say that, it hit me how lucky I was to have someone like her in my corner. Thanks, I said, my voice a little rougher than I meant it to be. I don't think I'd have made it this far without you, she laughed, shaking her head. You would have, you just needed a push. Maybe she was right, but having her there made the whole thing a lot easier to handle. Things started to pick up from there. Work got busier, but in a good way. I was taking on more responsibility, getting better at what I did, and people were starting to notice. Tina kept giving me more complex projects, and every time I finished one, I felt more confident in my abilities. And the money? Well, it was still tight, but it was getting better. I'd quit the security job finally, and while I wasn't rolling in cash, I wasn't worried about where my next meal was coming from anymore. For the first time in a long time, I felt stable, like I was on solid ground again. One afternoon, Tina called me into her office again. I sat down, half expecting it to be another big project, but she had this serious look on her face, one I hadn't seen before. Jake, I want to talk to you about your future here, she said, her voice calm but direct. I raised an eyebrow, not sure where this was going. Okay, she leaned back in her chair. You've done great work these past few months, and I think you're ready for more. I want to promote you to a full-time position. For a second, I just sat there, trying to process what she'd said, full-time. That was the dream, right? No more juggling jobs, no more scraping by. This was it. I don't even know what to say, I admitted, a grin creeping onto my face. She smiled back. Just say yes. And of course, I did. Walking out of that office, I felt this weight lift off my shoulders. All the stress, the sleepless nights, the self-doubt, it all seemed worth it now. I'd made it. Maybe not in the way I'd originally planned, but I'd made it all the same. And that felt pretty damn good. Getting promoted to full-time was like stepping into a whole new world. I mean, for the first time in my life, I felt like I was doing something that mattered. Not just for me, but for the people around me. I didn't have to worry about making ends meet, or whether I'd have to pick up some crappy side gig just to get by. This was it. Stability. 
But of course, life doesn't just magically get easy once you hit a milestone like that. Things at work got busier, like way busier. Tina wasn't kidding when she said I'd be getting more responsibilities. I was thrown into bigger projects, leading teams for the first time, and managing deadlines that felt impossible at times. There were days where I'd look at my to-do list and just think, how the hell am I going to get all this done? But I pushed through. I had to. Every day was a challenge, but it was the kind of challenge I'd been waiting for. The kind that made me feel alive. Even though I was still learning, I was finally in a place where people trusted me to get the job done. That was huge for me. One afternoon, Tina pulled me into her office, again. I swear, every time she called me in, I felt like I was back in school, waiting to hear if I'd passed or failed a test. She had that serious look on her face, and for a second, I wondered if I'd screwed something up. Jake, I've got another project for you, she said, sliding a folder across the desk. I picked it up and flipped through the pages, scanning the details. It was for a new client, some big company looking to upgrade their whole IT infrastructure. A huge project, way bigger than anything I'd worked on before. My stomach did that little flip it does when you're both excited and terrified at the same time. This is a lot, I said, trying to sound confident, but not too cocky. Tina nodded. It is. But I think you're ready. This is going to be a big deal for the company, and I want you to lead it. Let it. Those words hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, I'd been working hard, sure, but leading a project like this? That was next level. I won't let you down, I said, feeling the weight of what she was trusting me with. I know you won't, she replied, giving me a rare smile before getting back to business. The next few weeks were some of the most intense of my life. I was basically living at the office, working late nights and weekends to make sure everything was perfect. My team was great, but the pressure was on, and I wasn't about to let anyone down. I couldn't. Ashley was a saint during all of this. I wasn't around much, and when I was, I was basically a zombie. She'd bring me take out to the office when she could, sit with me for a bit while I worked, and remind me to take breaks. You're going to burn out if you don't slow down, she'd say, concern in her eyes. But I couldn't slow down. Not yet. This project was everything to me, and I knew if I could pull it off, it'd change things. Not just for my career, but for me personally. It was like I had something to prove, not just to Tina or the company, but to myself. I needed to show that I could do this, that I could rise to the occasion. The night before the final presentation to the client, I barely slept. I kept running over everything in my head, double and triple checking the details, making sure there were no loose ends. It felt like all the stress and anxiety from the past year had built up to this moment, and I was standing at the edge of something huge. The next morning, I walked into the boardroom, my heart pounding in my chest. The clients were all there, suits and ties, serious faces. I set up my presentation, trying to calm my nerves, but it felt like my whole career was riding on this one meeting. Tina was there too, sitting at the head of the table, watching me closely. I took a deep breath, reminded myself that I'd prepared for this, and started the presentation. It wasn't perfect. I fumbled a couple of slides, stumbled over a few words, but I kept going. I answered their questions, explained the plan, and showed them exactly why this upgrade was what they needed. And when it was all over, I stood there, waiting for their reaction, my palms sweating like crazy. For what felt like an eternity, no one said anything. They just sat there, flipping through the documents, whispering to each other. My stomach was doing backflips, and I was half expecting them to tear everything apart. But then, the head of their IT department spoke up. This looks good, he said, nodding. We'll move forward with the plan. I couldn't believe it. I actually did it. I wanted to jump up and fist pump the air like a complete idiot, but I kept it together, nodding professionally like this was just another day at the office. But inside, inside, I was screaming with excitement. After the meeting, Tina pulled me aside. Great work, she said, that rare smile back on her face. You've earned this. I don't know what hit me harder, her praise or the fact that I just pulled off the biggest project of my life.